as you notice from some of us, we're kind of going through ethics at this point, and there'll be an activity kind of thrown in, in along with that. Um, but we're going during this week doing ethics. Next week, we're going to be reviewing for the first test. And as I mentioned, way up at the beginning, it's really good if you can get a group of people together. And I don't know if there's any way to socially facilitate you talking with each other, I mean, apart from having to introduce yourself or something. Do you have any ideas on that? I mean, yeah. I can start a group me. You can do that. That'd be great. Can I pass my phone around so everyone can join in? Yeah, you know, there is a discussion thing on Canvas. Is there questions or how is this really different than that? The more chatter, the better. Like I said, I want you to do well. Often, what I do when we're reviewing, you know, I'll take a few more of those items uh, from the test bank and just review them with you. Uh, and that seems to work in last year's class and just things like that as well. Okay, so now that we're cooking. So where we left ourselves on Friday to talk a little bit about the big picture. I'm not really happy with the book. Uh, they start out with this statement that, oh, well, you know, there was this terrible thing called the Belmont, it's called the uh, Tuskegee syphilis study. And you know, that's a really you know, big thing. And then we go on and we discuss issues inside of psychology, like the uh, like the Milgram obedience study. And what stood out for me on that is that actually issues of ethics are far larger than that. And the reason that I'm reviewing all of these past government actions and past actions of medical professionals is that it's a, it's a really huge outstanding issue. It has run through our society uh, and and has cut across all aspects of society, the government and the military and our health professions. And you know, it goes even further back than that. In the interest of time, I didn't want to cover the history of gynecological medicine. And for example, the, the view, the racist view that black people don't feel pain as much as white people do, or Asian people don't feel pain as much. Uh, because they have thicker skin, supposedly. Yeah, a lot of these things that were done to people. The thing that I want to underline though for you on that is many of these people did this stuff in the firm belief that they were advancing science and they were doing the scientific thing and that the benefits far outweighed the costs. And so we didn't really need to talk to people about that trade-off because they were after all the great unwashed. I was just having some trouble staying on. Um, you know, we have not, for example, from 63 to 69, still given a lot of our military officers compensation for their exposure to toxic chemicals. And even down here, if you go in to these releases of bacteria in subways, you can Google that. And you'll find the military reports are still out there. And the military reports say, no big problem. This that bacteria is kind of benign, and you're only going to get sick if your immune system was compromised already. Now, you know, in our own day. Pharmaceutical companies often get very much into this thing. Here we have the you know, stock photo of the Tuskegee syphilis study. So, out of this, know what things they did that were bad. First of all, they lied to people. They were largely poor black people. Um, they didn't make them 
available of the fact that penicillin existed to treat this condition, to treat this condition. Right? Secondly, they didn't really respect people very much, and they kind of took advantage of them. So these were poor blacks, and they told them, you know what? We'll give you money for a really nice funeral. And that was so that they would have the bodies for autopsy. And felt coerced. In one case, with not having much money and the death of the family. Yeah. Um, they didn't treat people with respect. And they didn't make them aware of the costs and the benefits of their particular study that they were participating in. Well, those issues they can affect the And you do it now to the final yes, happy moment. Within psychology, ethics studies are also a primary concern. And the book talks to you about the Milgram obedience studies. It also talks to you about the value of conception in human research. Uh, the Milgram obedience studies were designed with a very laudable scientific goal in mind. Those people were pretty perplexed that an advanced Western civilization could commit the atrocities of the Nazi era. And they wanted to understand how many of people would follow orders because that was a lot of the defense of the military officers. So this is before the issue of uh, informed consent. And what they had people do, and we brought it in the book, was to say, you know, we need to do a study on learning and we need to understand how people respond. They were the Confederate there who was hidden from sight and the experiment basically coerced him. This was very traumatic for the people involved. Was it worth it? And people were not debriefed entirely after the study was done. So this is an example of, yeah, well, we do have a scientific justification for what we want to do. Is it really ethical to put people through the mental torment of this? And we'll have a second, you know, Variant on it where they strap the person's arm to the table uh, as an act of way of restraining them during the administration. Children are often involved in research and they bring about special ethical concerns. First of all, seeking consent, you need to consult of the custodians of the child to participate in it. But we're tired of giving models. What other ethical concerns do you think you're involved in the work in the You're going to do? I feel like they don't really comprehend anything that's going on, so they can't give an informed consent. Talk. <laughs> uh, sort of along those lines, I feel like we might not necessarily be as effective with children. Um, a debrief might also not be as effective on children um, along the same lines of them not really being able to talk. So, can I say effectiveness? Okay, more. Uh, suppose you're all kids and I walk in and I say, I'm interested in doing a study. Are any of your parents divorced? Does anyone like to talk to you and see the consumption? Mm -hmm. Children may not fully understand. Well, that's kind of comprehension, right? How 
would it feel if you had to raise your hand? Well, that's a good one. Yeah. If there's an imbalance of power between a researcher that's been told and a child, if you ask a question, they might feel obligated to answer. Well, yeah, and then you'll get. They might seem more unwilling to participate in it. They might seem more unwilling. More unwilling, yeah, like you just don't understand the uh, comprehension probably. But... Essentially, I don't know if this goes with how we're not if they need more to be more susceptible to like the weird. Uh, yeah. 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 How about easily coerced? There's another one that's kind of out there that. I'll just kind of come out with it. You know, if, if you come into a classroom and you say, these parents are divorced, or if you come into a classroom and say, who's participating in our free lunch program in the school? If you're asking children to self-admit to some things, or or even worse, if you're kind of speaking to happen in some of the Columbia schools, for example. We're interested in identifying uh, if caregivers uh, of low income children are particularly helpful or in need of programming. Well, if you've got to say, oh, yeah, our family's poor, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a having children admit something in front of their peers that's embarrassing. Ordering it as ran out of blackboard and on. These are all great things in making kids. There is kind of co easily coerced. There's also kind of social desirability. Those are more often private research methods that you, the researchers, don't think. They are a disadvantaged population. So, a lot of you folks are doing research in research grants. You've done your city training, probably. Uh, I think it's good to highlight issues. And I kind of learn something every time I go through my city training. Some of the other things about city training, I'm not so much of a fan of. You know, in what year did the Belmont report happen? Why do I need to know that? But the mandatory training is what we do. Uh, just for your information, when you consult, if you're working on big projects that involve another university, you might have to go in and log in and do the city training at that other institution. So you know, I've done some work with the Palo Alto Veterans Affairs Office, and you have to go in and do that city training. And it also involves a lot of special training for this university. Interesting fun fact, you know, if you're doing work in the VA. Confidentiality about some behavior is not covered. So, and then that's for the authority of some behavior. Uh, there is the ethical principles of conduct. I put it in the syllabus. I thought it's a little bit easier to read it rather than a screenshot. So this has a lot of good parts to it, uh, particularly with respect to research and publication and ethics with respect to human relations and so forth. To go through the major parts that you know, is your 
things you got to know for this class. There is an ethical principle of beneficence and non maltreatment. So, if you want to have a teacher in a school in a psychology department who treats you poorly and makes you feel like crap, this is actually violating an ethical principle of psychology. Every student should have some dignity that can be given the benefit of the doubt. You're not supposed to do things, you know, non maleficence is you know, just making sure that bad things don't happen to you. Know, you might conceal some information and debriefing a parent about things a child might tell you. Um, ability and responsibility. So you have a professional and scientific obligation to society and the communities in which you work. And you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go off and do my own thing. One way I try to keep that in mind, especially when you hear people in the university complain about how much we work and how low we're paid, consider the average income of people in the state of Missouri. You need to manage conflicts of interest that could lead to exploitation or harm. You consult with and refer with other professionals to the extent that we serve the best interests of those we work with. I mentioned before, way, way back a few weeks ago, and if you're thinking about problems, problems don't come in only one flavor. If you're thinking about alcoholism, that's a medical problem, a psychological problem, a family problem, a social problem, an economic problem. And if you have a client balancing those things or listening to the ways in which those things are part of it, it's part of your professional responsibility. Um, so integrity. Things have to be accurate and honest and truthful. Frankly, you know, over the 30 some odd years I've had here, it's been a great pleasure to have students who have been in the military. They don't lie. There's a culture there that people will lie if you lie. And I really valued that. Um, especially in the field of publication. Um, I talk a lot about retracted articles, and we'll get to that later on in the presentation. There's a real crisis in psychology given the rewards that I hear in publications and the fact that sometimes things don't get replicated. So, you know, we need to have a, we have a serious obligation to consider the need and consequences of our behavior. Justice. That things need to be fair and just. I mean, this is particularly important given the inequalities in our society and the stigma that we attach to certain certain populations in our society. And it's just we need to take precautions to make sure that on the rest. And rights and dignity. And the people have a right to privacy, they have a right to confidentiality, and they have a right to self determination. They have a right to say, I don't want to do the study anymore. They have a right to say, you know what? I don't, I don't want to sign up for your experiment. They have a whole liberty. This is particularly important to the population that is impaired. Or is a vulnerable population, culture, or comes from another culture. And these things are often hard to figure out and uh, hard to navigate. And any way that you can kind of meet, meet some of these requirements is to have open communication with the population and investment. What's an example? 
Well, I did time on frame. And they showed a video, and this was of the person who was Hispanic. And the person was talking to an investigator, and uh, he was always looking down. Yeah, in deliberations, the person said the other statue was like, oh, well, clearly this person is guilty. And they couldn't look him in the eye. In some Hispanic cultures, it is not considered appropriate to look at an authority. This presumption of guilt is entirely the fact of the cultural boundaries that we see. Those are the issues that I hope consider the most important. It is good to go on and look at the rest of these topics. Well, this is kind of a nice figure that talks about the mapping of the Belmont report and the topics that are coming underneath that kind of <coughs> together uh, these things and the definition. So these are terms that you gotta know when you're making flashcards. That's where there's a nice one to put them in there. Sometimes when we do a study, deception is necessary. So the book talks about the case of staging a test and seeing what people's reactions are. Sometimes this has to do with perception of race. Sometimes this has to do with people's willingness to admit to socially undesirable behaviors. Well, you can't do a study that says, oh, hi, I'm doing a study that looks at whether you're going to report someone more often based on race or not for having stolen something. Because people won't give you the right answers. So deception is sometimes used. We are obligated, though, to debrief people afterwards. Ethical dilemmas don't just hit you on the side of the head. Ethical dilemmas often involve very painful decisions between conflicting values. Uh, one of the people I worked with was the late Karen Fisher, who devised over a number of years ethical principles for psychologists as well as the world. And this is one of her stories. So let's just kind of walk down this. When the pressure to succeed, a first year student in the counseling psych grad program cheated on a final paper. The professor believes the student has academic potential and recognizes exposing the student's cheating would lead to expulsion from the program and affect their future plans to pursue a career. On the other hand, the professor is aware the student would be under pressure every day of his career and would be similarly tempted to resort to unethical behavior. She is aware she has a responsibility to protect the public from professionals who resort to dishonesty or their stress. What are the professor's ethical obligations in this case? I would say to society. Is there so therefore? The person should just be removed from the program and just shoot some other company. Yeah, because they'll always be tempted to perform unethical behavior. Mm -hmm. You also argue that the person has an obligation to be discussed with you. An obligation to what? Their students must be discussed with you. In other words, everyone makes mistakes and so you can use it. Yeah, college is supposed to be just where you learn stuff. <laughs> All right. 
opportunity enough in the times when we've had to deal with cheating in graduate school. It's been the smart ones to try it. So this is so disappointing. And then the answer is well, I didn't see any other way to do this. If you didn't expel the student, what could you do to make it work? You could what? Also, have them write a paper on what she did in the summer. Mm -hmm. Often, when you didn't get up, you know, you didn't cut it. You know, and if it were me, you know, maybe writing a paper. Writing a paper about how in psychology, um, people get kind of this tunnel vision. They just have to get through school. Juniors and seniors are easy to do that. <laughs> but actually, college is a really, really short time. So here's another one. Then use of the word retarded is, I guess, you know, dated now. Yeah. Here we have the case of a 52-year-old who was institutionalized since birth. Testing is not as retarded as you thought. The psychologist remembers recommends moving the person to pain. This will save about 10,000 a year and relieve overcrowding on the ward. She doesn't want to leave. She's really depressed. Does the psychologist insist on placement? Institution insurance, or should you respect the parents? Like she should move her anyways because in the long run it will make her more independent and it will make her happier. But they need to set in place like maybe some counseling and also like allow her to come back to uh, like visit her friends. When you're dealing with a 52 year old, uh, a lot has been put in place <laughs> by the time you're 52. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that says you have to go immediately from one to the other. We'll stop them out for a bit to the institution. And then they can come back. <clears throat> You do like a slow transition, or like you take them like maybe like a first weekend or two months, and then like slowly to see if they like you know, desensitize them. Yeah. It would be really scary to say you have to and go and live in this home, and we will teach you how to go grocery shopping, and you'll be on this you know, walking down the street in the company of people from home. Sadly, 
and especially in the state of Missouri, that ten thousand dollars and the crowding really, really plays a big role. And so our efforts to be more humane might be kind of outdated. A good balance of conflicting ethical considerations. I have kind of a story about that. Um, here, Bill, we call him Wild Bill. Uh, basically, they were, when Bill was young, his mother sent him to school. And there was something about you know, how he came to school that he just wasn't cleanliness issues going on. And they didn't speak very much. Strangely enough, you know, Bill, I have the feeling that given my Russian Jewish is I could speak a little bit of German. And as I just said, his father died from the Spanish flu. And he had a lot of trouble learning this field. As we all would when the language of instruction is different than what he's speaking at home. And he was good at an IQ test and he was classed as subnormal. So Minnesota sent him to Faribault State School for the feeble minded and epileptic. And he never saw his family. Uh, he was left there for 43 years. And he actually you know, took tests later and he was really pretty okay in terms of normal range. But and, and my experiences with Bill were, you know, he managed the coffee thing in the School of Social Work at the University of Iowa. Recently, given COVID and everything, they recently redid their coffee shop now. After Bill, he was the object of a movie. Mickey Rooney played Bill Sackler. Um, but it's kind of like we were saying in terms of institutionalization, Bill's never going to really along with humans the way that people who have a family and have not been institutionalized have them. You had to I remember I was walking with him with a group of Boy Scouts and Bill had used the bathroom. Wait for the No, I'm going to go right here in this bush. You, know, so you can't do that in the middle of town. But he was very happy. Um, but the, the, the level of harm was functioning as a result of those long years of institution meant that he, he wasn't going to, you know, go out and get married and have a job and so forth. He tried to make an environment where he was a firm, he didn't do something, and he took his job of coffee making very seriously and he paid for money to do that. Concerned about the media, and you want to compare the effects of a positive intervention with Now, the issue here is. We're going to use a weightless control group and a placebo group. <clears throat> but they're aware that using the placebo group will involve deceiving the subjects, and the use of a weightless group will involve refusing some individual's treatment for several months. Now, at the same time, we have a commitment to increase our knowledge about this problem. Failure to use control groups to limit conclusions. That's the responsibility. I think the responsibility in this one is to the patients and they need to rework the study to make it more comfortable. Because there is ways that you can test it, but what he's willing to do is not ethically responsible to the study. So very frequently we do have a weight loss group. Yeah. 
Okay, then I give them the treatment later on. Can you just give them a questionnaire and figure out like what it's been like up until that point, and then give them all the treatment at once and compare the past to see like what's going on? Something you're settling on clearly you have an obligation <clears throat> of beneficence to make the treatment available to all people at some point. And there is some suffering that goes on because maybe the people in the weightless group or the people in the placebo are not getting an effective treatment. They get some benefits, by the way, though, because if you're on a weightless group and you're not in the study, you're just on a weightless group. We'll call you someday. But if you're in a weightless group and you're in a study, they're at least contacting you. How are you doing? Do you have, you know, what are the issues currently going on? So they're getting some follow up here. And then hopefully, maybe you can look at the treatment. In some respects, maybe even the people who are in the placebo group or the weightless control group are going to end up better off than the people who got into the treatment groups. Why? Well, once you have done your study and you know whether cognitive behavioral work or pharmacological or a drug is going to help you, you know which one's better and you can administer the superior treatment to the people. So maybe there's an argument to be made there. Oh. This is a standard way of doing research <clears throat> in psychology, particularly with respect to psychopathologies. Your answers about this vary a lot as a function of the particular disorder you're looking at. It's extremely urgent you know, if you're dealing with the game is a lot different if you're dealing with someone who says they're suicidal. Dealing with a terrible, terrible disease, but the likelihood of death, impending death, is not as great as it is. So, <clears throat> informed consent <clears throat> is pretty critical in the way that we do that. Uh, now, in order to make that informed consent, we need to make sure that people have read, you know, have read and understand their rights. So, my, advi my advisor, Carl Ripley, my advisee, Carl Ripley, uh, did a study where he looked at consent forms. Guess what? It surprises no one. Nobody reads the consent form. They sit there, they sign the name at the bottom. So, very frequently in research now, we leave out the protocol for the person and then we say, you know, do you understand it? Or if you give them the consent, I say, did you read that consent? And they say yes, and I signed it. They say, okay, tell me what the study is about. And if they can't, then you walk through what's going on. <clears throat> People often don't look out for their own informed consent rights. And it's your job to make sure. Now to the part which starts to deal with the academic fraud issue. That Within the area of medicine, you know, within the area of psychology, academic fraud happens. In medical journals, this often happens because the people involved have a financial interest in the outcome of the research. <clears throat> Very frequently, drug companies will pay physicians or other researchers to do studies to show what's going on with their medications. And the researcher has a financial interest. Back in the bad old days, the company would say, well, and if you find an effect, we'll pay you this amount of money. If you don't find an effect, we'll pay you less. This set up a conflict. So people were very well motivated to do extremely, you know, every step they could to make the drug work really good. Um, and when we find fraud, we do need to act these things and to do really good jobs in the terms. That kind of reminds me, I was somewhat surprised about MD's change in academic dishonesty. When I came here, if you suspected cheating, 
you notify the administration and the administration carried out an investigation. Now, evidently, instructors have, as a football defense, they have the right and the prerogative to impose punishments for cheating that they see. And I think that's really strange. You have an appeal process for them. Uh, a lot of this has to do with we're talking about is the purportedly bad effects of that. Um, this also happens inside of psychology. Perceptions of dominance. I kind of made fun of that earlier. That you know, there's this power stance that you have. <clears throat> Presenting an illusion of corrugator activity, which again increases the uh, likelihood of dominance. Basically, this was never <coughs> replicated, and it kind of sounds silly that you know, raising the eyebrows of people involves dominance. But what happens inside psychology? Well, ethical treatment of animals is a great concern. Yeah. In psychology, we used to have lots and lots of animal labs going on. And at that time, a lot of the researchers, and I'm talking about the mid 70s, would say, well, animals don't feel the way humans do, they're not sentient. Now we have kind of a different perspective on that. We only do animal experiments when we really, really think we need to do them. And we try to minimize suffering and treat the animals to me. Nonetheless, Animal studies are very controversial in society these days. And at MU, we have had people attempt to free the animals in animal labs. Ethics do apply to animals, and you do get some information out of animal studies that you don't get elsewhere. That's an example of that. Well, MU, for example, had a researcher who was studying vision in cats and implanting little computerized chips in the cats to help them see. And that was you know, possibly a treatment for blindness. I've mentioned my son is being blind from that. Yeah, I really feel bad for the animals that suffer. Yeah. It gives us a route toward a cure for the therapeutic treatment. And that's kind of a dramatic physical example. Yeah. There are other psychological examples of psychology that happen. If we can better understand some of the physiology that goes on, that could probably help. Two things come to mind in that regard. One is, as I mentioned two weeks, three days ago, we have now come to an awareness that if we're looking at doing animal studies and generalizing them to humans, we're going to have to have both male and female animals. Well, why do people only look at male animals? Well, there's hormonal cycles in female animals, and this was thought to be variation. And when you're doing an experiment, you want to have as little variation across animals as possible. Well, pharmaceuticals, especially, and maybe therapeutic treatments also, are different for women than they are for men. So it's a way of you know, making some sense of science that we do very much of it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we'll talk a lot about the protests. 